you're in Psalms 81, did you find it? Good for you. Okay, we're going to read the whole thing. Um, I'm going to call this the shepherd's voice. Let's read all of Psalms 81. It says, to the choir master, according to the gittith, I like that word, of Asaph, sing aloud to God our strength, shout for joy to the God of Jacob, raise a song, sound the tambourine, the sweet lyre and the, with the harp. Blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon, on our feast day. For it is a statute for Israel, a rule of the God of Jacob. He made it a decree in Joseph when he went out uh, over the land of Egypt. And it takes a weird shift here. I hear a language I had not known. I relieved your shoulder of the burden. Your hands were freed from the basket. In distress you called and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah, Selah. Hear, O my people, while I admonish you. O Israel, if you would but listen to me. There shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to a foreign God. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their, their, uh, to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe toward him and their fate would last forever. But he would feed you with the finest of wheat. There's bread available in the foyer. And with honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. Okay. There's actually a lot here. And if we just start to kind of like scrape the surface a level uh, a little bit, we're going to see that there's a lot here. When you, when you come to the Bible, and if you've taken any of my classes, we say that, I say that, you should start observing what's there, when, who, what, where, why. You're, you're kind of asking questions of the text, and one that's hard to answer sometimes is when. And so when we ask, when is this? Well, when this is, is likely talking about what's called the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles is where every year the Jewish people would recall uh, life in the wilderness when they, were, when they were sojourners moving around in the wilderness for 40 years really almost 41, but um, when they're out there, they would build these tents, they still do today, build a shelter and maybe go like stay in it overnight or, or sometimes it's a little more decorative nowadays, but back then you, you, you built this, you built this, this, this tent thing, this, this, they called it maybe a booth, there's different words for it, that's not what's super important. What's super important is that this was every year we remember what God did. Think about like Thanksgiving, right? And you go around the table and it's, what are you thankful for? What are you thankful for? What are you thankful for? One year my nephew said, I'm thankful for me, not me, me, but me, him. It was like the cutest, he's all, I'm thankful for me. Um, but we're, we're, we, we say, what do, you, what, do you, what do you remember this year? What are you thankful for this year? Um, verses one through four is, is giving us a clue to that's what this is, that's what's going on. He's talking about this, this yearly rule and where you'd blow the trumpet. And this was a time when they would blow the trumpet. Without getting into the nitty gritty, it seems that this psalm is talking about that time where again, they rehearsed the good that God had done to them for over centuries, right? Over centuries. And so this probably is taking place at the, uh, or talking about the Feast of Tabernacles. It's possible that they sung this at the Feast of Tabernacles, because it's a song. So we know from the very beginning where it says, according to the Giddith, which is just cool, um, but that's probably a tune. It, it's probably a tune, the Giddith. What should we sing? The Giddith. Um, and it's a song of Asaph. And so Asaph was one of the guys that King David, who wrote most of the Psalms, uh, he designated Asaph and his family to be uh, kind of the royal songwriters of Israel, if you will. And so this is a song. So it's meant to be sung, right? If it's meant to be sung and it's about the Feast of Tabernacles, we can kind of be like, I wonder if they sung this at the Feast of Tabernacles. Do you see how this works logically? Yes, Andrew, we get it. We're really just thinking about bread now and the cricket that's back there. Can you hear it? Do you know why? It's because it's lodged itself in our exit sign and I don't have the heart to rip off an exit sign and kill it. Otherwise, it would be dead already. And now that's all you're gonna hear for the rest of the service is a cricket. Yes, don't listen to it, listen to me. That's, what the, that's the point of tonight, is like we're listening to the Lord, so don't listen to the cricket. Um, okay, also when is this? When is this? This is kind of a stretch of time, so he kind of bundles time together. You ever talk to somebody and they tell you a story and like pretty quickly you realize like they just went through like back in 1983 and also like my future hopes and today and, and tomorrow afternoon and they all kind of said that all in one sentence and you're like, 
when, when was all of this? That's kind of how this psalm works. It's a little bit all over the place with his, the way that he's talking. So he's making these past references to things that happened way, 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 way before. He's speaking at a certain point in Israel's history, and he's also talking about what's going to happen in the future. So it's all kind of all over the place. So the first thing is he looks back to the Exodus, back when God rescued them from slavery in Egypt, and he's talking about how God relieved their burden. They were slaves making storage warehouse cities, right? And, and God relieved their burden by rescuing them out of Egypt. And so he's, he's, Asaph is pointing back to that. But he also references the wilderness. He talks about Meribah. Meribah is uh, one of two names for this place in the wilderness. This is sort of confusing. It's one of two names for one of two places. There's like two places that they called two different things. I don't know don't blame me. But there's this place called Meribah and Massah, and it's like the same place, but it's also another place gets also named that. The point is this. These are places where the Israelites complained about God and complained about God not feeding them. That's what's important. This is the place of complaint. That's what I want you to see there. So he's, he's looking back to that in the wilderness. He's writing during uh, the kingdom time. So this is after the wilderness. If you're not super familiar, don't worry. But after the people, they've left the wilderness, they've come into their land, they've established a kingdom. Yay! And then Asaph is actually writing during that time of the kingdom. But he's also looking, he's, he's looking in the future. He's looking to this dark time that's coming. Way back when they were in the wilderness, God actually told Moses, hey, a time is coming when the people are going to make me jealous by pursuing other gods. And a time is also coming when I'm going to make them jealous so that they will come back to me. And he tells, he tells um, uh, Moses that the people will be flung out among another nation that they don't know, this foreign nation. That wouldn't happen for a very long time, but it's sort of predicted there, and it's kind of going to be hinted at here at the end, we'll see in Psalm uh, 81. Okay, so when is this? It's all of those times. He makes mention of this. He's, he, he, he makes this weird kind of literary shift. He's, he's going, you know, it sounds pretty standard in the beginning. Sing aloud to God. You're like, okay, that sounds, that sounds Bible-y. Raise a song. Blow the trumpet. It's a rule. We got to do this. And then it takes this weird shift. And he says, I hear a language I had not known. Now, what's mysterious about this is we don't know what language he's talking about. Bible scholars are a little bit divided, but some of them say maybe he's talking about the Egyptian language, meaning this is kind of the, uh, he's putting it in, the, in the, uh, an Israelite's voice saying, um, I'm surrounded by this foreign language that's unfamiliar. And maybe he's talking about slavery in Egypt. That's a possibility. The other possibility is that because who's going to start talking here in this psalm, it, the psalm shifts and it's sort of Asaph being like, hey, everybody sing, everybody sing, sing now, everybody. And then it shifts to God beginning to talk. So it also could be the voice that they didn't know was actually the voice of God. And why didn't they know it? Because maybe they weren't used to hearing it. We know that back, if we, if we were to put ourselves back with them in Egypt, they hadn't had the law given to them. They haven't really experienced God in any, any real way. Their ancestors had, but they really hadn't, uh, but they were about to. So it could be that they just don't yet know the voice of God because the voice of God, as we'll see in a, in a, in a little bit, the voice of God takes takes training to learn to understand what that voice is as opposed to other voices in our lives. So it could be, it could be Egypt. It could be God. One of those voices, whichever one it, which, whatever that means, one of those voices clearly is the voice of slavery and the voice of death and the voice of, of despair. And the other one is the voice of rescue and the voice of life and the voice of joy. And so it's kind of, uh, doesn't really matter which one it is. It doesn't matter if it's Egypt or God. That doesn't really matter. Because as we go through this whole psalm, what the psalm is doing is saying, here, you've got these two options. Which one will you listen to? And that's, that's really the heart of the whole psalm. So we're not going to try to figure out something that we can't know the answer to anyway. Um, with those two voices, we have to ask ourselves, then whose voice do I listen to? I'm not much of a, I'm not like the greatest. If you're really into like application and Andrew, give us something to do. You probably don't like when I talk and you probably aren't here tonight because you saw in the little app that I was talking and you're like, that guy never applies the scripture in my life. It's not my strongest suit to be quite honest. And yet this Psalm gives me kind of a softball because it gives a lot of application just built right into the Psalm. Uh, and so that is helpful. 
When I used to teach junior high, and uh, don't worry if you have kids in junior high because I don't teach anymore, so uh, I will not endanger them in the following way. But when I used to teach junior high, I would do an exercise with them, and I would have a kid. I told him it was a game. It wasn't really a game, but that's how you get kids to do stuff. I would blindfold a kid, and we had a, we had a stage that was, you know, definitely not this high, but, you know, you didn't want to... You don't want to fall off the stage. It's bad. So I would have a kid, I'd blindfold the kid, and I'd have the kid turn around, and I'd say, all right, everybody, shout instructions on how they can walk backwards off the stage safely. Well, this was just pandemonium, right? Everybody in the audience was like, ah! I'm sure some kid was like just giving like bad information just to get them hurt, and it was just everybody's yelling all at the same time, and guess what happened? Nothing. They just stood there. They just froze every single time. It was just predictable because nobody is going to walk backwards. And they weren't near the stage. They were like up here. So it'd be like, you know, take three steps back. No one's going to do that. That would just be, just be a disaster. And, so, and you can't. It's just, you know, 25 junior high kids yelling at you is, 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 is jarring. And so they would just stand there. And I'd say, okay, everybody stop. Everybody stop. And once I finally got them to stop, which took, you know, 45 minutes, I would go up on stage and I would say, okay, I'm going to tell you how to get off the stage. And I would just slowly be like, okay, take one more step back. Okay, you're not there yet. You're about three feet from there. Okay, one more step back. Okay, slow down. And I would just walk them through the whole thing. And the stage, you could take one step off the back of the stage. You'd be fine. And so I would get them to take one step. And okay, now you just got to put the other leg down. And then we were done. It wasn't much of a game. Really what it was, was me giving them an example of when every voice in the whole world is yelling at you, you get paralyzed, you really can't do anything. But when one voice, one voice who knows how to give you instructions and knows the way off the stage is, is talking to you, all you have to do is follow that voice. And that is kind of the point of the psalm. He's really talking about not all the voices in the world. He's really talking about the voices of uh, idolatry that would make them ignore God's voice. But at the same time, I think we can insert for ourselves these questions and ask ourselves these questions. I was trying this afternoon to ask myself these questions. They're not that easy to answer. So I want you to think about them. I want you to maybe, maybe uh, take some of them with you, but ask yourself these things. How do I know whose voice I really listen to? What voices have most of your attention? That could be as practical as what do you spend your, most of your time uh, listening to? What do you li like literally physically hear? I have developed a, an, a really wicked podcast um, uh, addiction. And I bought these like cheapo headphones and I can just put that in my ear. And like I have a little daughter and I can't stand like this doesn't, nothing against her, but I can't, I can't hang out for four hours I can't, but if I, if I can like listen to like the news, I can hang out for eight hours and it's, maybe that's bad parenting, but I just, it's an addiction, but it's in my ear, right? So what am I listening to all the time? What's getting my attention all the time? What's getting yours? What voices are you, are you most hearing? Whose approval and disapproval are the most important to you? Whose voice do you, do you want to hear approval from and do you fear disapproval from? Is it maybe the voice of even your parents, even if your parents aren't with you anymore? That voice can be really strong, really strong in the back of your head. And when they're not with you anymore, sometimes you can't resolve that voice. And that voice can be really powerful in our life, both for good and for ill. But whose approval and disapproval are most important? Who most stirs your emotions for good or bad? Who, who, who always gets you angry? Who's that person maybe that, you know, you, you, you hear that gossip from at work and you're like, yes, we should revolt. Let's kill the managers. Like, who's that person? Or who's the person who keeps you calm and helps you? And, and who, 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 are these, who are these voices? Um, who changes your thinking? Who actually can get you to, I used to think this, but now actually I think this. Those are powerful voices if somebody can do that in your life. And who, here's what's even more powerful, who actually shapes your behavior? Whose voice in your life, whether you know that person or not, they, whether they're just in the media or not, whether they're a family member or not, who cares who they are? Who can actually get you to do something different with your life? I've heard lots and lots of people tell me about their diet and exercise. I have never gone on a diet or exercised as a result, okay? That's Mostly me, that's not you, uh, it's my own problem, but uh, it would take a really powerful person to be like Andrew. I got Andrew to run. That would be like, oh, miracle if you could get me to ever be like, I, I saw him run to, where am I going? Bap baptism thing. No, I don't, I don't need the bread. 
That's why I don't run is because I eat a lot of bread, but uh, baptism, yes, okay. Um, who actually shapes your behavior? And that's going to be that's going to be key for us tonight. Because when somebody, when you're listening, how do you know when somebody's listening to you? It's when they actually do something. You've all had the you've all had the experience, whether it's an employee, whether it's a child, whether it's you, whether it's who cares. When you're like, you have to do this, and they're like, okay, and then nothing happens, and you're like, you're not listening. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm totally listening to you. I, I got it. I got every word. I'm, I'm, I'm listening. I got you. I got your email. I got it. And you're like, but you didn't, you didn't do it. Well, I know, but I was listening. I was really listening. I really, I really heard you. I really understood. I, I'm there. But are you, could you make a partial change? No, but I'm listening, right? We've all had this experience. It's incredibly frustrating. We've actually all also been this person. And that's what's going on here in this psalm. God is talking to them about, uh, hey, you remember the good old days that I, I, was, I was taking care of you, but your response is just stubbornness. Your response is you don't want anything to do with me. And so we know that truly listening leads to action. Romans 2.13 says, for it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. And we can freak out out and be like, ah, so you're saying my salvation is based on what I do? No, but clearly our salvation is shown by what I do because there's no such thing as quote unquote listening to God and making absolutely no difference in your life. That doesn't make any sense. If you're listening, it will come out. That's the only way to prove that you are listening. It's, it's, it's a natural outflow. Likewise, and you may be more familiar with this one, James 1, through 25 says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and he goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So how do we respond then to what God is saying? The, let's look at the difference between the Israelites' response and God's response. And um, OCD people, I apologize. I didn't notice until too late that these are like not level. So contractors, I apologize. Um, but I apologize. Okay, what's their response versus God's response? Let's look. If you look back in Psalm 81... Um, and we're going to go, we'll go to verse uh, six. I'm going to read a, a little chunk here. It says, listen to this. I relieved your shoulder of the burden. Your hands were freed from the basket. In distress, you called and I delivered you. I answered you in the place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah. Hear, O my people, while, while I admonish you. O Israel, if you would but listen to me. There shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to a foreign God. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. Okay. What's God's response to them? They call, it says, and God what? He listens. He responds. God, help us, save us. Okay. Okay. He did. He's already done. He's already done that. He's pointing back to Egypt where I've already done that. So God listens to them. And then what's their response to God who listens to them? We don't want to listen to you. Are you frustrated a little bit? You should be. It should be like, my teeth are grinding. Um, okay. God's response to them is shown in action. God didn't just be like, oh, I'm sorry you're in Egypt. I bet it's hot over there. I don't know. He does something. When they call out to God, he does something. But what about when God calls out to them? They not only just don't listen, what's even worse is they pay lip service to God. This is, if we take a step back here, what are we reading? We're reading a psalm about, that starts about them remembering what God had done in their lives and is likely a psalm that they sang once a year about what God had done in their lives and then probably sang the rest of it where it's like, and we don't listen to him. And we laugh. But we come into church, and if you're like me, you just sort of like, and now I am a robot singing the song, but I am really thinking about the bread and the cricket, but I am singing the song. Oy. That's not much better. That's not much better. 
we, how dare we pay lip service to a God who actually is willing to have action and listen in our lives. God's response to them leads to their freedom. God rescues them out of Egypt. He rescues them out of the wilderness. Their response is one that leads to slavery. They just want to go back and serve idols. These stupid little statues that they built for themselves, uh, and sometimes in, in really horrendous, wicked, violent, sexual ways, they want to go serve these dumb little statues, which the New Testament will say there's really demonic stuff behind those statues. That's what they really, really want. And so what God going to do in response, he's going to eventually cast them away out of his own righteousness. You really want that? Okay. If that's really what you want, go ahead. And if you've ever had somebody in your life that maybe you're trying to help and it's just not going well, and at first you had this whole rosy story in your life about I'm going to do this and they're going to, and this is going to be the story and they're going to be, and then eventually you realize like, I'm the only one helping here. You're not really participating. And now you're not just not participating. You're bucking against what I'm trying to do. And now you're just brushing me aside. And now you kind of resent me and hate me. And now you just want this thing that you just want to go back to. And eventually, all of us come to a place where we go, all right then. I guess you don't want what I have to offer. I, I, I'm just going to have to let you go to that thing. Now, sometimes that story actually does turn out well. When we let them go to that thing, they realize how empty that thing is, and the Lord draws them back. But here, he's talking about his people, Israel, and he says, basically, I'm going to then let you go where you want to go, um, but they're casting him away out of their own selfishness. I want, we all want, this is human nature, by the way. This is the definition of sin I would give you. We want to take God's place. If you were to ask me, like, what is sin? What makes something a sin? It's not like, you know, well, how bad? And if it's, uh, if it's a Tuesday, is it different from, like, if after a Wednesday on a full moon? Sin is the act of trying to take God's place in your life. This is how it begins in the Garden of Eden. This is how it continues in, in, in our lives is we go, I don't want you. I want me. I want me. I'm the best. That's really what it is. That's really what's under the surface there. And so God eventually will allow them to either have, uh, have them what they want. Is it Life with him forever or life away from him forever. Verse 15 says, those who hate the Lord would cringe toward him and their fate would last forever. C.S. Lewis says there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek find and those who knock to end. Uh, those who knock find, ooh, that's all. Uh, to those who knock, it is opened, I think is what I was supposed to have written there. Okay. We know in Romans 128, it says, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. When we, when we, when we fight hard enough against God, he's not going to force you to like, you know, no, well, uh, I'll give you a cookie. He's, he, fine. Go, take what you want, take what you want. But if you're saying, no, but what I want is I want, I want God. I want to hear God. I want to listen to God. You're going to hear this tonight and you're going to be like, what about me? Because that's not me. I'm not trying to push God away. I want to hear him, but I just don't know that I do. Well, take heart because God is, God is, God is ready there. Uh, he's ready to respond. This is what he says. This is, he, he describes his intention here. In verse uh, 14, he says, I would, meaning my intention is, to subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would, their intention is to cringe toward him and their fate would last forever. But he would, his intention is uh, to feed you with the finest of wheat and with honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. That's what God, this is what I wanted for you, he's saying to the Israelites. This is what I wanted for you. Uh, and they've pushed it away and pushed it away and pushed it away. And I don't think we can think that we are uh, quite much better. Here's a little bit of uh, Old Testament theology for you. Here's like a key when you're reading the Old Testament. If you ever read the Old Testament and you're like, I don't know how this relates to me. Let me give you like a simple, simple kind of little construct here. What should have been true of Israel is true of Jesus. What should have been true of Israel is true of Jesus when he comes. There is a bunch of ways that we could put this, a bunch of examples, but I'll give you three that I think pertain to this. Uh, the first is that Israel was and uh, should have lived as God's firstborn son. When you talk about the Passover, God calls Israel, they are my firstborn son. Now, obviously, 
collectively right, but he's saying, I love them as a firstborn son. They're the one who carry my name. They're the one who carry my image. They're the one who represents me. They are, they are me to you. They are my, my beloved son. Uh, that's what Israel was. And so when Jesus comes, Jesus is the son of God. He's favored and he's set to inherit the world. Uh, when Jesus is baptized, the, the voice of, of, of God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Later when he's transfigured and it's, his image changes, and if you don't know what that is, don't worry, don't get bogged down on, on the detail. But uh, again, the voice of God is heard saying, this is my beloved son, hear him, hear him. Okay, and he's set to inherit the world. When Jesus rises from the, from the grave, he says that uh, all things have been put under his feet. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. And so uh, Jesus is God's firstborn son as Israel was supposed to live as God's firstborn son. Israel's, Israel was supposed to be obedient. They're supposed to listen to God. They go into the wilderness. They're disobedient. So they can't go into the promised land. So they go back into the wilderness. Uh, and they stay there for quite a while. And they're supposed to go back into the promised land. And when they're supposed to go back, Moses tells them one more time in his old age, hey, if you obey God, these things will happen. It's going to be good in the land. And if you disobey God, these things are going to happen. It's going to be bad for you in the land. But they were supposed to be obedient, but they were not obedient. And so what's true uh, or should have been true of them becomes true of Jesus. Jesus only did what the Father directed, and he was obedient in the wilderness when he's tempted, and he's obedient at the cross, Philippians 2 tells us. Okay. They were supposed to let God feed and care for them. He says here, uh, you know, if they would only open their mouth, he would fill it. Uh, he would give them honey from the rock. He would, he would feed them in miraculous ways. He would feed them with the finest of wheat. He would feed them if they would only let him, but they won't. But Jesus, uh, after he after he's, uh, ministers to the, I believe it's the woman at the well, um, he says that he has spiritual food of which they don't know. He's feeding on the Lord. Uh, he's letting the Lord God, he is God, but he's letting God the Father feed him and sustain him. Um, he commits his spirit when he dies into the Father's care. He's letting God care for him. They won't let him care for them. Have you ever had somebody in your life where you're like, let me love you? And they just won't. That's Israel with the Lord. He's like, let me love you. And they're like, no, no, we don't need that. We don't want that. We want something different. We want something else. We want something less. And, and Jesus is going, yes, Father, I will let you love me. I will let you take care of me. Um, so when we go back through where this is happening, when this is happening, these reference points, he's referencing Exodus. And we know in Exodus, Jesus uh, in Exodus is our Passover lamb and he's the son that is killed, right? He's, he's uh, they're looking back at Exodus and it's, it's kind of this admonishment like, don't you remember? Don't you remember what God did? When we look through the Jesus lens back at Exodus, we go, ah, Jesus, uh, Jesus is our sacrifice. Jesus uh, is killed for us. He is that he is that son uh, that's killed just as the firstborn sons of Egypt were killed. When we look back to the wilderness, they're looking back and he's like, remember when you complained? Remember when you complained there was no bread? There's bread in the foyer and you wouldn't eat it and you complained um, in the wilderness. Well, Jesus is obedient in the wilderness, right? He, he resists temptation in the wilderness. Uh, they're talking right now during the kingdom time and it's a good time, but it's about to not be such a good time. And uh, we, what we get from that is if it's about to not be such a good time and we're about to get a string of of really frustrating kings who, by the way, don't listen to the Lord. And if you ever listen, if you ever read First and Second Kings, it's like banging your head against the wall. It's like, and this king didn't, you know, and this king loved idols, and this king loved idols, and you're like, oh my gosh. And you're kind of supposed to. I really believe that's the right response. Oh my gosh, is like, that's what you should feel because it's putting you in the perspective of God. And you go, oh, oh, that's how God sees this. That's how God sees sin? That's how God sees us? Yes. But Jesus is the king of kings. He establishes God's good rule on the earth. Uh, it's pointing forward to the exile when they're going to be kicked out. They're going to be finally, God's going to say, okay, enough. You want to be like all the nations? Have what you want. Go be among all the nations. Go live with them. Go live with idols. Go do that. I will send you into their territory. You go. Jesus uh, is also going to be crushed by worldly power, the power of Rome, but he's going to do it to call the nations to himself. So Jesus, he's like reversing the flow of all that they've got going on, all this wrong stuff they've got going. Jesus is going to show up and go, reverse that over here, change the course of that. Let's make that new. So he comes and he, the one that we're told to, you know, hear him, listen to him. He's the one you should listen to. This whole song is like, listen, 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 listen. And Jesus shows up and the father says, listen, listen. 
Jesus says of himself in John 10, truly, truly, I say to you, he who uh, does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes out before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they do not, they will not follow, uh, but they will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come, came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, he does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Jesus comes and he says, listen to me so that we can all be together under my good care. He's the voice we need to listen to. It's him. There are lots of voices in your life. There's lots of shepherds in your life. There's lots and lots of people, whether you are personally acquainted with them or they come through the little earbud in my phone or whatever it is that want your attention and want to guide you and shepherd you through things. And there is no voice no voice. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's me. I don't care if it's Pastor Brian. I don't care if it's your favorite news site that you're like, finally, I found the golden news site that tells me the truth. All of those have a, have a human sinful nature and an agenda for you that won't necessarily be the right voice you need to listen to. It's God's voice that you need to listen to. Do you know God also has an agenda? <gasps> He's biased. Yes, God has an agenda for you because God's will for you is his, is, is his will for them that he would feed you, that he would take care of you, that he would rescue you, that he would free you, that he would give you life abundant. That's not a bad agenda. Let's follow that agenda. That's what God has to say to us. We might as well go there. When we go there, when we find faith in him, and faith in him means that we follow him, and follow him that we, means that he shapes our, every aspect of our life, what, becomes, what is true of Jesus becomes true of those found in him. Me and you, if we have faith in him, everything that be, is true of Jesus becomes true of us. These things, first we said, were supposed to be true of Israel. They are true of Jesus, and they can be true of us. We then are called God's firstborn sons. The believers are in the fellowship of the firstborn, Hebrews 12, 23 says. We're all firstborn. We're all beloved that way, and we all inherit that way. We're given favor and inheritance, Romans 8, 17 says. We are obedient because we are counted obedient, Romans 4, 5 says. We're counted righteous, uh, just as if we'd always obeyed. And we let God feed and care for us. The believers are always fed by Jesus' sacrifice. Mark 14, 22 tells us. Um, and when we come and have communion, we remind ourselves that we're fed uh, by the very body of Jesus. And so what, what, what we see here, how do we make the leap from Psalms 81? And you're like, I've never blown a trumpet once a year. I don't know what this is. This isn't for me. I don't have a camel. I don't know what the, I don't sacrifice animals. This is too weird. This is a very direct line to you because what it's saying is, hey, God, God's people must listen to him. God's people must listen to Jesus. You are God's people. You need to listen to Jesus. Okay. How do we know? How do we know if we're listening to God? Uh, let me ask you these questions. Do you take time in prayer to wait? Do you ever in your prayer, and this is hard to do, and I have a hard time with this. Is your prayer all you talking, or is there a time where you pause and say, God, do you have anything to say to me? I'm just going to sit here for a minute and hear from you if you're, if you're willing to speak. Do you pray for God to guide you in your life? Do you, do you, do, do you blunder forward and, you know, I'm going to do it? Or do you say, God, I, I don't know what to do. Guide me. Are there things in the Bible that seem important to God but not to you? You read Jesus going, I have sheep of a different fold, and you're like, I don't care as long as I, you know, as long as I'm a sheep. Who cares about those other sheep? Are there things that aren't important to you that seem important to him? Are there ideas in the Bible that have not yet shaped your life? Are there things you, maybe you, you struggle with, I, that, that, that doesn't sound like me yet. Are there areas in your life you are falsely justifying? Are there places where you're going, I know what God would say, but I'm pushing it aside? And does scripture disagree with, surprise, confuse, and challenge you? 
None of these are, are maybe except with the exception of one, these aren't marks of like, you know, failure. These are good things with the exception of, you know, if there's something you're falsely justifying, you should ask the Lord to help you come to truth on that. But with the other ones, um, they're good marks that you're listening. When you're learning, and, and I, I teach classes here and, and I've taught in different, you know, ways. When you watch somebody struggle with an idea, that's a, that's a clue that they're learning. When it's like, I don't know how I feel about this. And they come talk to you after class and they're like, could you re-explain? that. I don't know if I, I don't know if I like that. I don't know. And I have these other verses that I'm going to argue with you. That's all a sign that that person is, is learning. Usually sometimes they're just argumentative, but usually it's like, I'm, I'm trying to get my head around this. I'm trying to grapple with this. I want to know what this means. When we come to the Bible that way, and it's challenging to us, that's a really good thing. And so these are actually marks that you might be listening to God. And those are, that's, that's good. If, if you, on the other hand, um, for instance, if scripture never disagrees with you, it always agrees with me. It always makes me feel good. It always is, you know, nice and, and neat and in its nice little box and, and it's just perfect. And there's, you know, it just it has a bow on it and it's, it's just fine. I'm never confused. I always get it. And it's not challenging. It just makes me feel nice. You are not listening because scripture is hard and scripture is challenging because scripture is from the Lord and not from us. And so you should be challenged then by those. Some principles of listening to God. Remember that you and I are not prone to listen to God. It's a practice. We are not just like, you know, born and like, oh, God, what do you have to say to me today? That's not how we live. That's not how you live and I live. Don't pretend it is. Um, we, we have to make a practice out of it. And we have to practice uh, sometimes by making some mistakes. We have to find what is his voice as opposed to mine, the world's, the devil's. Uh, we don't listen only for our own benefit or, or happiness. So maybe, we, you know, if I go, okay, I found something for me, check. Well, we also want to listen. And what does this mean about others and others that I should care about and others that I should serve? Uh, listening may not lead to full understanding, but should lead to full faith. Meaning I may listen and hear from the Lord and still not fully understand what he's talking about all the time, but I know what I need to do. I know how I need to respond. Uh, hearing is not the same as listening. We covered that, so I won't continue to, but hearing uh, means not action. Listening requires action. And remember that God is ready to respond to your call. If you say to the Lord, I, 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 I want you, I need you, I need you to speak to me, he's going to do it. Here's the warnings that we have, it's, and it, this really goes back to the Old Testament. And so again, there's that link between God's people then and God's people now. Hebrews 4, 6 through 11 says, therefore it remains uh, for some to enter it, God's rest, salvation, peace forever. And those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day today saying through David, so long afterward, uh, in the words already quoted, I know it sounds kind of funny, but this is, he's quoting the Old Testament here saying, hey, this goes for you too. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. Meaning the Old Testament wasn't enough. That rest in the promised land wasn't enough. That wasn't everything. There's a better, bigger rest that God wants to give his people. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. What he's saying is, if they back then were talking about rest in the promised land, and they were like, you know, if we, if we sin, we don't get that. And if we, if, we, if we obey God, we do. You have a much bigger rest at stake, which is eternal rest with the Lord, eternal peace with the Lord in his presence. And so the very first thing to ask yourself tonight is, do I listen to the Lord at all? Do I respond to the gospel at all? Do I believe it at all? Has it shaped me at all? That's the first thing to ask. And if the answer is no, then the question is, do you want that? Because if you want that, when we cry out to the Lord, the answer is coming. And the answer is welcome, welcome my new child. Um, James 1.5 though, if you're like, no, Andrew, I, I, I do believe, I am saved. But I don't know if the Lord speaks to me. And I don't know if, I don't know if, uh, how do I listen to him? How do I hear him? I always like this verse. James 1.5, if anyone, if any one of you, if any of you, sorry, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. God is never going to slap your hand away when you need wisdom. He's never going to be like, you loser, why do you need, why are you asking me this again? He's never going to do that. He without reproach will give freely to any who ask of him. And so this is sort of a simple you may be like, that's not a real answer to my question. It is and it isn't. If your question is, how do I hear from God? My answer is, keep asking God to speak to you. 
And you're like, that's lame. I'm glad the sermon was free. I'm glad there's bread because that doesn't help me. It actually does help. It actually does help. And this isn't like Bible sleight of hand. It actually does help because the God is going to, the God, God is going to answer. He's going to answer in his time. He's going to answer in his way. And he may not tell you everything that you want to know, but he's going to answer what you need to know. He's going to answer what you need to know. And so we turn to him for wisdom. But the question is, will we, will we hear him? Will we let him shape our thinking, shape our behavior, shape our life? Will we really, uh, will we really let him speak to us? Um, Romulo? I think we are a no, yeah? I don't see you. You are, you are away. So I'm going to, it's 8.14, so we're going to be done. And then I'm going to efficiently leave, and you're going to leave with what? Bread. Very good. Let me, let me pray, though, real quick. Let me pray. Uh, Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being a God who listens to us. Thank you for being a God who cares what we have to say, who cares what's going on, who loves his people deeply and dearly in ways that we don't even understand. And so, God, we ask, Lord, first for those who maybe have uh, never really begun to listen to you, never really opened their heart to hear from you, never really wanted to know what you thought, never really wanted to know your ways, never really wanted your perspective. God, did you bring them to the end of themselves and the end of that? Um, before you get to a place, Lord, where you, where you give them everything that they think that they want, um, Lord, in your mercy, would you call them to yourself? Uh, Lord, for those who, who, who believe and, 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 and their lives are shaped by you, but still um, there's that question of, do I listen? Um, how do I listen? How do I hear from you? What would you have me do? Um, God, would you, be, would you be speaking? And if there's people here tonight, Lord, who just desperately do not know your voice um, and are in the dryness of the wilderness, God, would you, uh, would you introduce your, your voice to them in ways that they've never experienced? Would you speak things to them through friends, but mainly through your scripture, uh, through sermons, but mainly through your scripture? Uh, God, for those who've just allowed themselves to be distracted by other voices, the world's voice, their own voice, the devil's voice, their family's voice, their friend's voice, all these other voices, God, call us back to your voice. Be the voice, the loudest voice, the clearest voice, the truest voice in our lives. We thank you that that's what you offer us without reproach. And we say these things in your name, amen. 